thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to give a few opening comments because uh, the title uh, was Value Investing uh, in the Current Environment, and I think uh, I was thinking about a better title, and it probably would have been, is value investing dead, or is it just sleeping? Uh, and. Uh, Right now, uh, we actually, and by the way, the answer to that, you would expect me as a value investor to say, no, it's not dead. Uh, but I'm probably going to say, well, maybe yes, it, it could be. Uh, I don't know, would be another answer you might hear from me in a few minutes. And the last one would be, I don't really care. OK, so I think I covered everything. <laughs> So where do we sit? Uh, let me tell you where we stand today and tell you what's going on in the market. Uh, we value companies uh, bottoms up. Uh, so if we think about the S&P 500 in the United States, we value every name in the S&P 500 bottoms up uh, back to when we have good data in 1990. And we can contextualize where do we stand today, or at least as of yesterday. Did pretty well today, but uh, where, where we were as of yesterday relative to those 28 years. And we were in the uh, 19th percentile last last night versus the last 28 years. All that means, uh, according to our measures of valuation of individual stocks, uh, the market's been cheaper 81% of the time since uh, 1990 and been cheaper 19% of the time. We can go back in time and look and see what's happened over the next, it's not a projection, it just says, hey, what's happened from this valuation level in the past uh, over the next year or two? And what's happened in the past from the 19th percentile is year forward returns have averaged about 4 to 6%, two year forward 10 to 12. Now, during during uh, that uh, whole period, those 28-year period, the market averaged about 10% returns, so you're probably familiar with. And so we're expecting subnormal returns, but not negative returns. Even though we're expensive, not, not negative returns. The uh, Russell 2000, which is stock number 1001 through 3000 in the United States, that's a little different story. Uh, at the end of September, it was in the second percentile, been cheaper 98% of the time. Now with the market falling, it's in the sixth percentile, been cheaper 94% of the time since 1990. And what it's been here in the past year for returns have been about flat. Okay, so so pretty expensive. Uh, it, since we're talking about value investing right now, if you look at the way traditionally uh, Russell or Morningstar classify value names, uh, from 1980 to 2006, value outperformed the market by about 2%. Since then, 2007 to today, growth stocks have outperformed the market by about 5% a year. Uh, so quite a big turnaround, long time since value has been good. Actually, through September of this year, in the United States, uh, there's a uh, index called Russell Pure Growth and Russell Pure Value, which is just the growth stocks, just the value stocks in the Russell 1000 index. And the Russell Pure Growth was up over 28% year to date through September 30. The Russell Pure Value was up 1%. Huge dichotomy, 27%. That's come back to earth a little bit in the last month, but it's still a 15% spread growths outperforming value, which kind of is the same story we've seen for the last dozen years or so. So hence, you know, is value investing dead. Now, Russell and Morningstar and other places define value as stock selling at low price to book values, low price to sales values. And uh, if we were talking about that, the answer is, is value going to come back? And, and I don't really know. Uh, there's been a whole move towards factor investing where uh, people take factors within uh, companies or stocks. And, you know, it's very clear like a factor like momentum's worked for the last 30, 40 years, not just in the United States, but across the globe with maybe one or two exceptions, worked very well. And I have no argument that it has worked well for the last 30, 40 years. But if it didn't work for the next year or two, it could be that it's just out of favor for a few years and all we have to do is be patient. It works over the long term. Or it could be that momentum investing, uh, you know, there are plenty of ability to crunch numbers and data and computers and smart people and research papers. And it could be that too many people are doing momentum investing and the trade has become crowded and it's degraded. If it didn't work for the next two years, I wouldn't know the answer to that question. Is it, should I just be patient? It works over the long periods of time and it's 
it's just cyclically out of favor, or has the trade become crowded and degraded? And I feel the same way with low price book and low price sales investing. If a company is selling close to its uh, book value, that means it's selling close to the historic cost of its assets. That means that the market is not giving much of a premium for the actual value of the business. It's clearly out of favor, and if you buy a bucket of companies that are selling close to its book value, probably pretty sure that you got a bucket of companies that are out of favor, okay, and that the market's not liking, and it's likely that, uh, that that did work for quite a long time, but I would view that it was a correlation of companies, more than your fair share of companies that might be out of favor. But momentum and low price book, low price sales, to me those are correlations. Those have correlated with good returns in the past, but stocks actually uh, are ownership shares of businesses that we value and try to buy at a discount. They are not pieces of paper that bounce around that you put sharp ratios and sortinos on and uh, you know try to make some sense of. These are actually ownership shares of businesses. And I, I make a promise to my students first day of class at Columbia every year. I promise them first day of class that if they do good valuation work on a business, I promise them that the uh, market will agree with them. I just never tell them when. <laughs> could be a couple weeks, could be two or three years, but if they do good valuation work, the market will agree with them because that's, that's what stocks are. So um, we value businesses. Once again, that's what stocks are. It's an ownership share of a business. So how do we do that? There's really no black box to how that looks at. The analogy I usually use for my students and, and whenever I'm trying to teach anyone about investing, I, I try to use an analogy that they can relate to. And so I use buying a house. And let's say they're asking to keep the number simple, a million dollars for the house. And your job is to figure out whether that's a good deal or not. Okay, so what are the questions you'd ask to try to figure out if that million dollars was a good deal? One question you might ask is, uh, if I rented that house out, net of my expenses, how much would I get? So if I could rent out that house for 70, 70 or $80,000 a year, net of my expenses, and we know interest rates in the US anywhere around 3%, that might look pretty attractive. So that might be one question I would ask. Another question I might ask is one I'm sure you would ask next too. It would be like, what are the other houses on the block going for? In the block next door, in the town next door, how relatively cheap is this relative to other similar houses? And that's what we do too for companies. We say, how cheap is this business relative to other similar businesses in the same industry? How cheap is it relative to all businesses that we can buy uh, right now? We also go back in history and we say, how is it being priced now versus how it's been priced versus other companies historically? So all that really means is if a company has traditionally been premium priced relative to the market and now it's available at an average price, well, it's cheaper than it's traditionally been. On well, that particular measure of relative value, would get a good grade. If a company has uh, been bargain price traditionally relative to the market, now it's available at an average price. Now it's more expensive than it's traditionally been. On this particular grade, it might get a, a bad grade. So we just use our measures of absolutely cheap, relatively cheap, versus similar companies, relatively cheap versus all companies, and uh, relatively cheap versus history. To tell you how powerful that is, if we can cue that one slide I have, hopefully we'll find it. Just caught a glimpse of the back of my head. That wasn't good. Anyway. Um, Right here uh, on the x-axis is our valuation percentile. This is a study that we did of the 2,000 largest stocks in the United States over a 20-year period from 1992 to 2012. We just uh, updated it for the next five years. It looks exactly the same. But this is a 20-year period, 92 to 2012. The x-axis is the valuation percentile. So we're looking at the 2,000 largest companies in the US. The bottom left-hand corner, uh, if you fell in the first percentile, uh, you would be the 20 stocks at any particular time that measure cheapest according to our measures of absolute and relative value, and I just went through them with you, okay? Absolutely cheap on a cash flow basis, relatively cheap in various ways. If you fell in the first percentile, bottom left-hand corner, you're the 20 cheapest stocks out of the 2,000 largest. On the right-hand corner, and you fall in the 99th percentile on the x-axis, you are the 20 stocks that measured most expensive at any particular time. The values of businesses aren't changing daily, but the prices are, so the rankings of the companies change daily. 
So now the y-axis, more importantly, is the year forward return for stocks in each percentile during those 20 years. So what this says is stocks that fell in our first percentile averaged a one-year forward return of 38% during, uh, during those 20 years. Stocks that fell in the second percentile averaged a one-year forward return of 37%. Then we dropped down to that best fit line, which we never mind missing when we're making extra money. And as we measure something more expensive, the year forward return drops. And it's pretty linear. In fact, if we had missed so badly the, the best fit line in percentile one and two, and I never mind making extra money, and we move those down to the best fit line, that fits about 0.9%. So the measures of absolute and relative value I just told you about are approximately how the market values companies over time. Isn't that great? And if you were sitting in my class at Columbia, and I said, does anyone see a long, short stock trading strategy that you would pursue if you could predict ahead of time which stocks would do best, second best, third best a year forward? And you didn't say, I guess I'd buy those guys in the upper left-hand corner and short those guys in the bottom right-hand corner. If you didn't say that, I'd throw you out of class because it's pretty straightforward. That's what you should do. And that's what we do. So if you've been, uh, you know, uh, in other words, valuation, these simple valuation metrics act like gravity. So what's wrong with this chart? If you've ever been investing, you know that there's no strategy that works like this every day and every month and every year, and neither does this. This is an average over 20 years. If I showed you a snippet of two or three years, it would be a nice fit, but it would be like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, right? If what we did worked every day and every month and every year, everyone would do it. It doesn't work quite that way, but this tells us we should stick to our guns. So if two years from now, the way we value companies and rank them in the simple way we talked about houses, if that doesn't work, it's certainly possible the market doesn't reward us, but we're not going to change what we're doing because that's the way stocks are priced over time. We're going to be very patient. Since stocks are ownership shares of businesses that we value and try to buy at a, uh, buy at a discount, that's never going out of favor. Momentum may go out of favor. Low price book investing, low price sales investing may go out of favor, but this is why we stick to our guns when it's not working. What we do makes sense over time. Now, I was trying, I'll just tell you a couple of quick stories and then maybe we'll get to some Q&A, but um, so a friend of mine is an orthopedic surgeon and, and he's head of a group and, and he asked me to uh, speak at a dinner to about 150 or 200 orthopedic surgeons, talk about the stock market for a little bit and then take some questions. So I finished uh, talking and then the first question I got from one of the doctors was, uh, you know, hey Joel, the market was down 2% yesterday, should I get out? And the second question was, oil was up a dollar yesterday, should I get in? My conclusion from those questions was that I had just crashed and burned. They didn't understand anything I had said. <laughs> And so about a week later, uh, I guess it was fortuitously, uh, someone asked me to teach a group of, uh, one hour a week, teach a group of ninth graders about the stock market. And the, these kids were from Harlem. They really had no money, no background in stocks. They certainly didn't have all the degrees of the doctors, and I had just failed with the doctors, and I didn't really want to fail with the kids. So I had about a week, and I thought long and hard about how I was going to walk in to class first day, and I walked in with a big jar of jelly beans, one of those old-time glass jars filled with jelly beans. And I passed it around the room, and I passed out three by five cards. Since we're in Canada, that's three inches by five inches, these little cards, okay? And I asked the kids to count the rows, do whatever they want, but uh, write down how many jelly beans did they think were in the jar. And I went around the room and I collected all the three by five cards. Then I went around the room one by one, Asking each, uh, each of the kids, I said, you can keep your original guess, you can change your guess, that's up to you, but how many jelly beans do you think are in the jar? And I went one by one around the room and wrote down those guesses. So here are the results of that little experiment. The average guess of the three by five cards, when I averaged them all out, came out to 1,771 jelly beans. And there were actually 1,776 jelly beans in the jar. Pretty good guess. The average when I uh, went around the room asking one by one how many jelly beans in the jar, that was 850 jelly beans. 
And I explained to the kids that the second guess was actually the stock market, because every no, everyone knows what they just read, who they just talked to, what they saw on TV, what they read in the paper. They're influenced by everything around them, and that was that guess. When they were cold in calculating, and more importantly, independent, not looking around, not talking to anybody else, counting rows, being cold in calculating, and independent, they were much, much better. Okay, so that's what we try to be, cold in calculating jelly bean counters like that chart, where we're just doing those things like we're valuing a house. Uh, we try to be very unemotional about it. But we all know that this is, you know, hard stuff to do anyway. I'm making it sound pretty easy, and that's all we do. And, but I do, every last five or six years at Columbia, sometime during the semester, a student will raise their hand, and at some point in the semester, every year, it happens, and they say, hey, Joel, congratulations on a nice 37-year career, but isn't the party over for us? You know, we know the challenges of active managers. We know there are a lot of hedge funds and computers and ability to crunch numbers and all this stuff. A lot of people doing this. Isn't the party kind of over for us? And my students are second year MBAs, roughly 27 years old on average. So I say to them this, I say, I'll tell you what, why don't we go back to when you guys learned how to read? All right, we'll take a look at the most followed market in the world, that would be the United States. Let's look at the most followed stocks within the most followed market in the world, those would be the S&P 500 stocks, and let's take a look at what's happened since you guys learned how to read. So I go back 20 years, you know, when they were seven years old, and I said, from 1997 to 2000, the S&P 500 doubled. From 2000 to 2002, it halved. From 2002 to 2007, it doubled. From 2007 to 2009, it halved. And from 2009 to today, it roughly tripled, which is, which is my way of telling them that people are still crazy. <laughs> And it's way understating the case because the S&P 500 is an average of 500 names. If you actually lift up the covers and look at the dispersion going on amongst those 500 names, between which are particularly in favor at any particular time, which individual, individual stocks are in favor, and which are out of favor, the ride is much wilder. That doubling and having, doubling and having is an average of 500 stocks. You know, underneath the covers, it's really much crazier. So if you believe what Ben Graham said, that this horizontal line is fair value, and this wavy line around that horizontal line are stock prices, and you have a disciplined jelly bean strategy of counting, you know, valuing businesses, you have more, uh, and buy more than your fair share of companies when they're below the line, and if you're so inclined to sell or sell short, more than your fair share when they're above the line, the market's throwing us pitches all the time. The reason active managers don't win, their behavioral problems, their agency problems, you know, I sat on a lot of big investment boards, you know, 10 billion and over, and uh, even though, you know, some of them might be a university or something where there should be a perpetuity, no one's retired you know, uh, it's not a pension, it's not an individual. They should really be a perpetuity, but there is a guy who is assigned to picking U.S. managers, and there's a guy who's assigned to picking real estate or bonds or whatever, and he's got a three-year benchmark. And I'm not saying they fire him if he doesn't make his three-year benchmark. I'm just saying they're not throwing him any parades either if he doesn't. So everyone has these agency problems. So, you know, they have a book out there be, uh, called The Big Secret that I wrote in 2011, and I always say it's still a big secret because no one bought that book. So. <laughs> So you can just, you know, go get a free one out there. You can't sell them. But there are a couple of studies uh, in that book that, uh, you know, I want to share with you. Maybe you don't have to read it after this. So, so one of the studies looked at the best performing mutual fund for the decade 2000 to 2010. I wrote the book in 2011. And uh, the best performing mutual fund in the United States, 100% long U.S. equities, was up 18% uh, per year. And during that decade, the market was flat. So winning, beating the market by 18% a year is pretty good. The average investor in that fund, he lost 11% a year on a dollar-weighted basis. And we all know how he did it, right? Because every time the market went up, after it went up, they piled in. After the market went down, they piled out. After the fund outperformed, they piled in. After the fund underperformed the market, they piled out. And they turned that 18% annual gain into an 11% dollar weighted loss. They weren't there to collect the profits. Uh, the best performing institutional managers, the ones who ended up with the best tenure record and in another study, the top quartile managers for the decade. So listen to these stats. The, these are the guys who ended up with the best tenure record. 47% of those who ended up with the best tenure record spent at least three of those 10 years in the bottom decile of performance, bottom 10% performers. 
79% spent at least three of those years in the bottom quartile. 97%, everyone spent at least three years in the bottom half. In other words, to beat the market, you have to do something different than the market. Your returns are going to zig and zag differently. So that's the only way to beat the market. So if you're smart enough to find this great manager at the beginning of the decade who's going to end up outperforming, almost no one stays with him. Because to beat the market, you have to do something different. Your returns are going to zig and zag differently. So I'll just tell you how we tried to solve this, because one of the reasons we manage money is to make money for our investors. And if no one's capturing that money because they're always leaving and coming in at all the wrong times, they come in after you did well, they leave after you did poorly, uh, they're not going to capture those long-term returns for a good strategy. So we came up with a strategy called Gotham Index Plus, just bowing to human nature. And we said, for better or worse, most people use the S&P 500 in the United States for a benchmark for the business. And so we said, we'll start there. And what we said is, We'll put a dollar into the S&P 500, bottoms up all the stocks in the S&P 500. And then, so you have a dollar invested there. That's not hard to do, so we don't charge for that part. We think in our head we don't charge for that part. Then we go out and buy 90 cents more of our favorite S&P stocks, and we short 90 cents of our least favorite S&P stocks. So we have that dollar plus a 90 by 90 long short overlay there. And what we do is we don't want people to lose by much. In other words, computers like Sharp and Sortino ratios. Uh, human beings like tracking error, meaning they don't like to lose. And if they're going to lose, they can't lose by much because then they're not going to stay with you. So we balanced that 90-90. We balanced its beta. We didn't let small stocks drive returns because that's going to drive tracking error. We also balance the type of stocks we go long and short, meaning we buy companies. Typically, the companies we short are the opposite of one, ones we're buying, meaning they're losing money or they're trading it 100 times pre-tax free cash flow. Why are people buying them? Well, they think 2024, if you want to think of Tesla, is going to be great. you know. And some of them will be and some of them won't be, but it's the world's worst investment strategy. That was the bottom right-hand corner. That, those stocks in the bottom right-hand corner on that chart is the world's worst investment strategy, and that's what we're trying to short. But you can imagine there are reasons why people like them. Maybe sales are growing fast or something else is going well for those companies. And so uh, what we do is we match fundamentals. So in other words, if you looked at the sales growth in the 90 cents we like, uh, it's just as good as the, the sales growth in the 90 cents we don't like. We're just getting them a lot cheaper. And so we tried to balance all these things. These are compromises that we made so that people could stay with us. And you know, in that strategy, it's called Index Plus. It's really a, a, a tip of the hat to say, you know, I gave a speech at Google. I'll just finish with that, and then we'll, uh, Mo will come up and we'll take some questions. I gave a speech at Google about a year and a half ago, and I started this way. I said, even Warren Buffett uh, thinks that most people should just index. And then I said, I agree with him. Then I left, and that was, no, then, uh, <laughs> then I said, you know, but Warren Buffett doesn't index, and neither do I. How come? I think we're good active managers. We want people to stay with us. We're cold and disciplined jelly bean counters. So we came up with this index plus strategy to really as a tip of the hat to the fact that I do agree it's very hard for people to stick with something that underperforms for a while. So we tried to minimize that, but still getting an extra return. So that's sort of what we came up for for individual investors, but I think it's also appropriate for institutional investors because everyone uh, can't stick it out for, for, for uh, that long a period of time, even if they should. So anyway, by the way, the big secret was patience, okay? It's in short supply, so now you really don't have to get it. Anyway, Mo, why don't you come up and we'll take some questions. That was great. Okay, so I, uh, first of all, Joel, thank you for that. Um, great context. And I'm just looking at some of the questions that came in, but just before I do, before I get to them, how would you tackle the Amazon question? The fact that here's a company that never made any money would, uh, would be, I mean, ostensibly the, at the lower end of that spectrum since inception, uh, and, and whether or not there's a new paradigm in the world. How would you tackle that question? Sure. So, you know, um, there was a uh, writer, I think it was in the 30s, and, and uh, his name was Damon Runyon. And uh, the show Guys and Dolls was based on his writing. You know, he wrote about gamblers and guys in Brooklyn and whatever. And uh, one of the things he said, you know, it starts from Ecclesiastes. He says, uh, you know, the race is not always to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. But that's the way to bet. And so... 
Amazon actually does gush a lot of cash right now, but it didn't for a while. And we wouldn't have liked it uh, for a while, but I call that the tyranny of the anecdote. In other words, we're short hundreds of names in the bottom left-hand corner. It's a really bad idea to lose money long-term, you know, as I showed. It's a really bad idea to buy things at 100 times pre-tax free cash flows. That's the type of things we're shorting. The laws of physics do not get repealed. If you're short hundreds, I mean, if you're only short Amazon, you could get in real trouble. But on average, it's a really good idea to short really expensive things, things that aren't earning money or eating through cash and destroying capital as they invest. There'll be some winners whether it's Tesla or Amazon or whatever it is in that category, and you'll know their names because they won. But most of that group uh, are not going to do well. So if you have a diversified portfolio of companies with those attributes, uh, you know, that's what we're doing. And on the long side, it's really the same thing. You know, Apple's been one of our biggest positions. It was the biggest for quite a while. And, and uh, the market didn't, you know, was uh, letting us buy it really cheaply. How come? Well, um, we're in Canada, so I can say this. Most people used to have a BlackBerry. <laughs> And now they don't. And so... There's one applause in the room. <laughs> so, you know, people view Apple as a hardware company and it's going to crash and burn like all of them do. That's the negative spin on Apple. The positive would be that it's an ecosystem of products that play off one another. It's a brand name that people like, you know, Coca-Cola sugar water, people still buy it, you know. So it's a brand name. It's a uh, ecosystem of products that play off one another. Uh, and then the negative side, it's a hardware company. And the truth is probably somewhere in between, gray, somewhere in between. And the truth is I don't know. But this is what I know. If I can buy companies that gush cash at cheap prices, that earn huge returns on capital at a big discount to the market, I don't know if Apple's going to work out, but we own a bucket of apples. That's why I use Apple. We own a bucket of apples. We own a bucket of companies with those kind of attributes, and I know my bucket's going to work out. So that's what, you know, if we're short, if we're long a bucket of apples and we're short a bucket of Teslas or JC Pennies or whatever it is that's losing money, that's really what we're doing. We're trying to take advantage on average. You know, that's why insurance companies don't sure one or two people. They, they want to be right on average. Right. And so you, you mentioned uh, your strategy for, uh, call it ETF plus or indexation plus, um, and we came up with a couple of conversations today with Rob Capito and Anthony Scaramucci about the impact of uh, an ever-increasing number of investors participating in, in ETFs and, and indices. Uh, what do you believe, what impact do you believe that has on active investors such as yourself? And um, do you believe that it's creating more or less opportunities in the process? That's really a great question. So, uh, and I'll answer it in two parts. One, I really do agree with Warren Buffett that most people should just index. If you don't know how to value companies yourself, and you don't know how to evaluate managers, then really it's probably your best choice. And, and I would say uh, a majority of people don't know how to do those things, and that's why I'd say most people uh, should just index. And I think the move to indexation or passive investing uh, will continue. And uh, the drive towards lower fees, because unless you can prove that you're adding value as an active manager, you have to compete with these passive products that are very cheap, uh, if you're an active uh, manager, that's, um, that's something that you'll have to contend with. So I am not that optimistic about the active management business. I think it'll continue to be threatened, and to be honest, as well it should be. Okay, even though we're an active manager. On the other hand, as a stock picker and someone who actually knows how to value companies, I'm happy when tons of people quit. So I think it's a great world for uh, active stock pickers like we are. Uh, as a business of active management, it's bad. Right. As uh, someone who wants to beat the market and the people who can and, and, and know what they're doing, I think it's a, it's a great plus for us. And so thinking about your strategy, how do you handicap risk? 
um, beyond the fact that you know, the trades could go against you for any number of irrational reasons for any period of time. How do you handicap risk in the meantime, if at all? And then more generally, how do you handicap risk at Gotham to sort of sustain your performance? Oh, sure. So uh, I left out something. You know that beautiful chart I showed you with the you know, upper left-hand corner making so much money and, and the right-hand corner, and I asked that question. Um, you know, my students, uh, you know, and I said, if they didn't say I'd buy the upper left-hand corner and short the bottom right-hand corner, I'd throw them out of class. Uh, I wasn't exactly being straight because if you literally did that, you put a dollar in the top corner and you, and you shorted a dollar in the bottom corner, uh, you wouldn't have any money left. Uh, if we hit another year like the year 2000, when rational, uh, rational thinking was thrown out for a period of a year or two, uh, you would have lost so much money, you would have been down to zero, and zero doesn't compound very well. Okay, so this, your question is very important, uh, risk management. You know, how do we balance these two? So we always buy the cheapest, short the most expensive, subject to risk constraints. So we're trying to balance these two sides in various ways. We make sure our betas aren't mismatched. We make sure we don't have too big a mismatch within industry groups or types of companies. And that's just prudent, not because... Uh so we buy the cheapest, short the most expensive, subject to risk constraints is really what we're doing all the time. We're trying to balance those risks really to get to the long term. The long term was that chart, and that chart was one year forward. So usually you don't have to be that patient, but sometimes you do. Sometimes there are two, three year period where it's not rewarded. And if we were, as I said in the beginning, momentum investors, I would start worrying whether this is a crowded trade. It's correlated with good returns in the past, but it may not in the future. But if we're actually viewing stocks as ownership shares of businesses that we value and buy today, discount. Uh, what I promise my students what I believe. The market will eventually get it right. I can't tell you exactly when, but it will. That's what stocks are. Uh, ben Graham said the market is a weighing machine. Uh, you know, it's a voting machine, which means it's emotional in the short term. Uh, but it's a weighing machine in the long term, meaning, you know, the truth comes out. Uh, that chart sort of shows that it does, but it makes the ride look much smoother than it actually is. So you have to be able to withstand those times and realize what you're doing, you know, we, we're valuing companies like you'd buy a house. You're not going to all of a sudden, you know, have an investing strategy if you just think about how silly some of these things are. Like, if you if if you told someone you're you know just going to go go around the neighborhood and buy the houses that are up the most in the last month, you know, people would think you're kind of. <laughs> You know, maybe not the brightest. I have a house so. to sell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so people, but when they come to stocks and you get prices daily, and 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 people come up with all kinds of crazy things that uh, they think will work, and 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 they may. But valuing a business is really what stocks are. It's an ownership share of a business, and that's what you really come down to. And <clears throat> excuse me, you you uh, if you know where. Uh, you're very self-deprecating. By the way, his books have sold. <laughs> There's many of them have been sold. The big secret. Did. <laughs> it's yeah, it's exactly. a big secret. Um, but you know, throughout your books, it's clear that you're a student of history. And when you're looking at markets, and there's a lot of talk in some of the other conversations we've had, where are we now? What is this? Is this like the late 90s? Is this the late 20s? Like, do you have a sense of where we are? What market does this feel like? Does it matter? And do you have an uh, a view on that? Well, I think, you know, what I opened up with, uh, and, and I talked about contextualizing where the valuations are today across the market. You know, if we weight the S&P and the weights of the S&P 500, look at the valuations of each company, by bottoms up, and I said we're in the 19th percentile. And the best we can do is take a look at what's happened from this valuation level. That's really what drives returns going forward. What price are you paying now? What, what are your returns on that investment going to be based on what price you're paying now? Now there are things that uh, could move it beyond the four, you know, what could happen? The market's in the 19th percentile, year forward returns four to six percent on average. 10 to 12 over the next two. Yet over the 28 years we looked at, the market averaged 10% returns. So what could get us back to that? Well, one thing that could happen from this is that if the market were to fall 18 or 20% tomorrow, returns going forward from that point would get back to the 10% expected returns that we've come, become used to. It doesn't mean we have to get there, but that's one way we could get there. But here's another way we could get there. If 
companies have their normal trajectory of earnings. And we under-earn. We earn 4 to 6% a year for each of the next three years. Three years from now, we'll also be very close to 9 or 10% expected returns. We under-earn for three years. Nothing terrible happened. Nothing extraordinary happened. And we also get back to 9 or 10% returns. Like I said, no guarantee that we do. But those are two ways that you could get back to that. And so, you know, making short-term projections is not something we do. What I will say is that the way we look at it is we have long short spreads as, and we're trying to have our longs beat our shorts. In an environment like, you know, I was talking about how well growth has done. Now, we're not typical value investors, but we're also not growth. As Warren Buffett would say, growth and value are tied at the hip. Growth is part of value. And so when the market goes straight up without corrections, other than this month, but for years it's gone straight up without corrections, people take risks, and they take more risks. They don't have to pay for them. They take more risks. It doesn't, you know, they don't have to pay for it. So we're short, we're short what I would call hope stocks. These are things that aren't earning any money now or aren't earning very much. They're priced on how well these companies are expected to do in 2023 or 2024. These are hope stocks. People are hopeful that they get better. And in a straight up market, people get very hopeful. And they, those shorts do quite well. Luckily, we're not low price book, low price sales value investors. We're actually valuing businesses. And the way you value a business, the way a private equity firm would value a business is based on cash flows. And when people get optimistic about the world, they do get optimistic about our cash flows. And our longs can also do well certainly better than uh, typical value stocks. And we usually can keep up and, and add a return. Uh, and so in a straight up market, we've been able to do that. But I'm very excited about the future because I don't think the market will continue up from these valuation levels at a 15 to 20% annualized pace like it's been doing. I think a more reasonable pace would be normal to subnormal to even some negative returns during some periods. And those are great news for our spreads because I can tell you one thing, if the market turns down big, they're gonna take high price cash eating companies out and shoot them. And they do it like clockwork. They'll take those ones at 100 times. They'll, they'll get killed. The companies we're buying already cheap with low expectations built in tend to hold up better. So the environment, the way I'm looking at it, is not predicting where is the market going to be. But I do predict from these valuation levels that, as most of you would, that the market's not going to continue. It's unreasonable to think the market will continue up at 15 to 20% pace. And if it just gets to be more normal or subnormal or negative, that'll be great news for our long short spreads. Sure. So uh, a lot of the, uh, the philosophies that you've sort of articulated are in line with um, some of the more traditional value investors. You talked about Graham and Buffett. Um, do you talk about any of the beliefs that you have that are deeply contrarian or philosophies that, you know, uh, I would say very few people would actually agree with you on? Oh, okay. Well, by definition, being contrarian, I guess, uh, I can't agree with what you just said. <laughs> uh, yeah, people can say they're contrarian, but most people aren't. They, it's very hard to buy companies that are out of favor. Most of the things we're buying that are gushing cash, have huge returns on capital, yet we're getting cheap. How come? Okay, because that's looking backwards. That's what they did last year. The reason we're getting everything we do cheap is because people don't think the next year or two will be quite as good. And if you're an active manager, whether you have a long time horizon or not, pretty clear your clients don't, okay? And regardless, when you're buying stocks, you want to make money in the next few years. So your typical hunting ground for buying stocks that are going to make money in the next few years is not amongst those companies you know are not going to do quite as well in the next year or two. So most of the things we buy are systematically avoided by almost everyone else, and that's how we're making money. So people can say they're buying out of favor of things, but they're really systematically avoiding them, and they, they do it pretty consistently. Right. So we have time for just one more question. Um, okay, I think uh, your career and success of your career goes uh, without saying, but um, could you talk a little bit about what was perhaps the most dramatic and educational investment mistake that you've ever made um, and uh, how it was instructive for you? Yeah, I'm sorry you asked that, but okay. <laughs> um, I got a lot of that today. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, once invested in a company that uh, owned a trade show uh, called uh, Comdex, which was a very big trade show. And 
in, in, in Las Vegas every year. And I understand the computer business is always changing, uh, but every year they had like 2,400 exhibitors and 400 would go out of business and 400 new ones would come into business. And I thought, you know, the business of computers wasn't going uh, away. And what I loved about this business is it was my lesson in uh, operating leverage. So in other words, there was plenty of convention space in Las Vegas and uh, they could rent any amount they wanted at $2 a square foot for this convention. And they got from the vendor $62 a square foot. <laughs> so that's called operating leverage, meaning uh, you lay out $2 and there's no incremental costs and, and you get paid $62. So when you're growing, that is really wonderful, you know, when you're growing. But when you're shrinking, uh, that $60 drops right to your bottom line. In other words, you sold less space, you were making 62 minus two, and now you're losing $60 for every $62 in revenues you're losing. Uh, and that's called operating leverage, and everyone knows financial leverage from 2008 and you know other places. Just you put up a dollar, you borrow nine dollars, that's a risk, and you buy something for ten dollars, that's a risky thing, everyone knows it. Uh, but companies with big operating leverage, uh, people aren't as uh, knowledgeable about. So, you know, leverage works both, way, both ways. You, you know that expression. So uh, it works that way with operating leverage too. When the business was going well, it was a great business. When it was going badly, it turned badly quickly. So that was my lesson in operating leverage. Uh, I would say the great thing, uh, actually in my class, I always talk about all the things I did wrong. And... Uh, uh, you know, uh, and I'm not that great an analyst, really. I try to pick easy ones. You know, Warren Buffett says, just look for one foot hurdles to jump over, okay? And no one forces you, uh, you know, to swing at every pitch that's thrown to you. So you can just wait for your pitch. And those two things are very powerful. Just look for easy ones, wait for, for the easy ones. Uh, and so I try to make my students feel comfortable that I've made so many mistakes in my life and still done, you know, investing life. And still done quite well and you know it's really a question of what I wrote in the big secret you know patience patience discipline are really uh, attributes that are in short supply but that's really the the big secret Joel thank you so much that was fantastic we really appreciate you flying up the round of applause